as their parent, they trust you and what you're saying. So I would say just share, um, let them know the, the full journey of how they got to be in this loving family that you're creating for them. Yeah. So honesty is the best policy. Honest, literally just be honest, just share. Um, because, and I think that question when it comes up, it's because they're surrounded with things that say family looks differently mm -hmm. um, than their own. So I think it's important. And another reason why we have exit, it's important for them to see families that look like theirs. Mm -hmm. um, and What's up everybody and welcome to the Queerly Black Show. I'm your host, Ashley, and I'm so happy you came by. The Queerly Black Show aims to normalize the everyday existence of Black, LGBTQIA plus individuals through an interview-style series with regular folks like you and me. So every week, a new guest shares their story and unique perspective on their existence as an LGBTQIA plus individual. Thank you for tuning in, and make sure you subscribe, download, set your reminders to the podcast so you never miss an episode. Enjoy the show. Welcome back to another episode of the Quirly Black Show. My name is Ashley. I'm joined today with a special guest from Parent X Hood, the founder. We have Mia Cooley in the building. Mia, tell the people a little bit about yourself. Oh, goodness. Hi, everybody. I'm really excited to be here. Like, I'm really, yes. really like, I was just running around here trying to get all this together. But hi, everybody. My name is Mia Cooley. I go by the Big Mama Mia. I'm the founder of X Hood. We are an organization that's dedicated to helping Black queer people navigate their family building and nurturing processes. So anything from fertility, adoption, blending families, separations, even, um, we help you answer all those important questions and get you paired with the right resources along the way. Awesome, man. Awesome. We, we definitely don't talk about that stuff. You know, there's not a whole lot of uh, information and platforms out there talking about this kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. I think it's going to be it's, it's going to be a very interesting conversation. Um, but before we get into that, we got to talk about you. <laughs> what is your story? So how did you from a little girl <laughs> get into the ex hood? So what is your coming out story? Sure. So I was always going to be, at least according to my parents, the person with a million kids. Like my dad used to joke with me and say, like, I'm probably going to have 20 grandkids and they're just going to be from you. I have always been really into nurturing and just families and I love to cook. Um, I'm originally from New Orleans, so that's already a place that is just rooted in family building and having large communities and especially Black communities. Um, but as far as coming out, I didn't have a big shebang. Um, I literally was in college, maybe high school, and I was having girl problems. And I was talking <laughs> to my parents and I'm like, something, 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 she, blah, blah, blah. And my stepmom was like, she? And I was like, yeah, she, keep up, like, let's go. <laughs> I'm like, so then I just finished the story and then they were like, Okay, so like, what do you want to, like, how do we help you? Do you want advice? Are you just looking to vent? Like, that's just kind of how my parents are. They always ask, like, what do you need from this conversation? Um, and we just kept it going past that. My mom, I thought she's deeply religious. So I thought that she would have a bigger response. And so I had a little anxiety around that. Um, but she was like, you know, I already knew. And you you know that I'm going to approach any and everybody in love. Um, and that's what she has continued to prove and do for me and for my family. So, so you was already like dating the girls and then I had a problem. It was like, listen, elbow yeah. deep in problems. I'm like, I was a teenager. So I'm like, I mean, at this, at this point, those were like small minuscule problems. Right. But at the right. time they were my whole world. And I'm like, right. I just want to go upstairs. I don't want to go to sleep. I'm done with these girls. Like forget this. But, um, they talked me through the situation. Obviously I have moved on long since then, but at that time, it was like world shattering for me. Absolutely. Because <laughs> what else do we have to worry about <laughs> when we're like in high school? I mean, track that. practice, cheerleading yeah, practice, exactly. girls. Like, <laughs> <that was it. laughs> when'd, you, when'd you have your first girlfriend? My first girlfriend, probably like official, will you be my girlfriend? Probably not until college. Mm. But yeah. before, in, in, in uh, your younger years, it was kind of like, well, you like me, I like you. Yeah, I mean, I'm still the same way. I was just really busy and I lived, um, I moved away from New Orleans and then I was in Pennsylvania and the community that I was living in was just really very white. And I was not interested in dating romantically, being involved with white girls. It just wasn't my thing. Um, 
So I had to wait <laughs> until yeah. I got, got out of high school. And when I got to college, I, was, I went to Temple University. Shout out to everybody that's Temple made. Uh, our Black community is very strong there. So it was like mm-hmm. amazing. I was like, oh, this is a heaven. Like, I mm-hmm. love it here. <laughs> yeah, Philly. And, and then uh, Temple, yeah, in Philly, they got a big... Uh, queer community too i'm yes. from i'm from jersey so you know okay. philly's right across the right across the way right across so yeah the so, oh yeah, yeah. I was feeling right at home and ready to like explore and flip that place upside down uh-huh because <laughs> then you you're in the north a little bit you know what I mean? yes <laughs> right? we good up here when did when was your first um like when when was you when was your first encounter with your sexuality so like when did you first be like oh i, I like the little i like the shorties <laughs> probably elementary school mm-hmm. um like I just loved pretty girls <laughs> um, and even like like any like crush or that was a guy that I had they were a li- just a little bit more feminine and I can say any elementary like boyfriend that I had they're gay now um, <laughs> so I don't know what, what that means but clearly <laughs> I was always coming along that route but definitely elementary school like I just loved being around the pretty girls my, I think my parents thought it was about popularity or proximity to popularity but I just wanted to hang out with the pretty girls <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah I like pretty girls um that's that's crazy uh so how did so then you go through college um come out of college uh you know official relationships and everything like that um mm-hmm. when did you start exhood I started X hood in May of 2019 so Mother's Day actually of 2019 it was founded because there was no space like it. So I was, you know, just, I tell people I had three babies in one year. So I birthed one baby and then my ex fiance had two babies that she also brought into our relationship. Um, and it was like, I needed like the quick road to motherhood. And then we were like talking about getting ma- or I'm engaged. So we're getting married and we're talking about if we're going to have another child and trying to navigate what fertility, fertility would look like for that. Or if we were going to adopt, I'm really big on adoption. Shout out to all the adoption parents. Um, yes. My mom was adopted. So it's really near and dear to my heart and it's something that I really want to do um so we just didn't know where to get answers for all these things and so I'm very you know relatively extroverted I will go into these other spaces like there is no shortage of mommy groups and in those mommy groups it was like okay this doesn't feel right for a black woman and then I would go into like the black mom groups and it's just like they were asking questions that we're homophobic, we're transphobic, and I have a queer son, and I'm queer, and so I would be in in the comments going to bat every day, and I'm like, I came here to find community, and I can't do that because I'm spending the entire time arguing and defending, you know, myself, defending my queerness, um, my humanness in in, in all these comments, and I just couldn't do it, so even then when I would go to like just queer groups, it's not, you know, the focus is not parenting for the most part. They're looking to party, they're looking for romance and I'm here for all of those things. Um, but it can also feel unsafe as a parent. Um, and that's specifically because the intrusiveness around um, a lot of the times around like how lesbians are already have children and like wanting to know, you know, valid concerns. Are you co-parenting? Um, is your is your child a product of you know, assisted reproduction, is that other person still involved? Like, so I feel like there's a lot of healing around um, the the family dynamics and our relationship with the greater queer community. So I just decided to start a group. And I was like, I'm gonna start a group and I'm put it on Facebook. It was probably gonna be me and five other people in here. And now it's me and 3,500 other people. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, congratulations on that. You know, that, you know, is just a testament to how necessary the community is because, you know, it is, it is tough. And I, and, you know, just to, to follow that up, like, what are some of those things like when you go into these spaces that, uh, particularly the black thing, right. You know, mm-hmm. with, um, going into these spaces, what are some of those things about, uh, you know, race that kind of come into play? You know, a big part for me was erasure. So, you know, the world has been turbulent for ever, but um, specifically like social justice at this time with black death and people dying and queer people dying, it would felt like I would go into those groups and they were just having a normal day. And I'm like, I'm trying to figure out how to talk to my kids about this. I'm trying to figure out like, you know, how, how we stay safe and protect it and, you know, how we contribute and give back to our community. And they were talking about like baking cookies. And I'm like, that, 
that's not that's not where we're at today like somebody's mm-hmm. child died last night and mm-hmm. um so that erasure was a big part of it and then being kind of gaslit and like you're you're pulling the race card um whenever there was something that was actually race related about you know treatment from teachers um treatment from medical providers um and it just felt like okay I, the resources that i need aren't going to be found in these groups because you don't even see it as a problem um it's not something that is is your truth and so you can't see outside of how it may be a real issue for people like me and families like mine yeah yeah totally totally and I think definitely uh you know you started in 2019 so there was (laughs) a million things going on around that time and then of course years after that you know even more um what about you know specifically like black um maternal health and um you know health care as a black person um specifically like having a baby and the importance around like adequate care and stuff like that um I know there's been a lot of um you know conversations around that for both you know queer people and heterosexual people but um what have been some of the the things you've heard around that or some of the um, resources Parent Exit has, has provided around that issue? So Black birthing people actually have a three times higher mortality rate um, through birth and delivery. So what that means is that we are at a three time higher rate of dying or being seriously injured um, during birth than any other demographic. And so that right there is scary, like, because giving birth is already like life altering and life threatening. Your body is going through a million and one changes. Um, But where that three times higher comes in is because of systemic systemic and medical racism um, and seeing, not seeing black people as needing um, as much care and attention and prioritization as other demographics. So when you're not in a space where you know, if you're giving birth, it's really hard to advocate for yourself because you're in a lot of pain. You can be passing out. You may not have a partner. You may, like, it could be a number right. of reasons why you cannot advocate for yourself. So this is why one side, just sidebar, get a doula. If you're going to give birth, get a doula, get a doula, get a doula, because <laughs> you need someone that can advocate for your needs um, when you're going through this process. Yes. Even if you are a partnered person, shout out to your partner. They're amazing. They are not the person that is going to advocate for you because they are emotionally involved. You're their baby. They They don't want to see you hurt. They don't want to see their baby hurt. And it's hard to step out of that and make objective decisions for your care when you're going through that emotional thing. So get a doula. But back to the the mortality rate thing. Um, What that also leads to for us is because we know that it's such a dangerous position for us to be in as Black birthing people, it leads to more postpartum depression for us, postpartum anxiety for us. um, And and then that mental health aspect impacts how you can come out on the other side and your ability to raise kids. Um, and was like, where was I going? Yes. So it impacts your ability to raise your children because now you're struggling, struggling with depression and anxiety that's rooted in, um, that lack of care and that lack of being prioritized as a human. Um, and obviously the just fear of death, because this whole thing is scary. The, one of the most vulnerable points you'll ever be in in your life is when you decide to have um, kids as a queer person and when you give birth to that kid. Um, and so I wanted to put together um, an ex hood put us directly in touch with the providers that we've seen that are life affirming for us. So a lot of what we do is that um, resource matching that we talked about going directly to the providers that have proven that they are life affirming for us, that they care um, to see, you know, black birthing people survive, I mean, live through their journeys and to also know that they feel affirmed and that they're confident that we come out confident knowing that we can parent and nurture happy children as well. So resource matching with fertility providers, we do a lot of um, fundraising, helping us bridge the gap, helping a lot of families bridge the gap for the financial costs associated with assisted reproduction and adoption. Adoption is expensive. Um, We also help you navigate um, the processes because Black and queer people, I will say in in general, um, struggle with being approved for a lot of um, adoption programs. And so the cost associated with us is just knowing like what you need to say, what forms you need to fill out, how you can advocate for yourself through those processes 
services as well. So we do resource matching. We also have peer coaching programs um, because trying to conceive and being even like when you're past baby and you have teenager like I do, having a teenager and trying to navigate like what they need, it can be lonely. So we pair people that have um, like experiences together so that they can walk these journeys together um, and see themselves in a successful place. Whereas before you don't see a lot of queer couples like in like family um, products, commercials or mm -hmm. books. There's nothing um, out there that's specifically speaking to us. So I wanted to create something that allowed us to speak to us and show up for each other because we're gonna do that. That's what queer people do. We're the, we're the I like to say the blueprint of these non-traditional families that they call us. Anything from like your, your ballroom houses to how we've, you know, queer people a long, a long time ago have been putting together families and adopting and taking care of one another. So we're the blueprint for this family building thing. And I'm just ready to show the world that. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's so, so, so true. And so you have uh, children of your own, um, specifically a teenage son. Yes, I have a teenage son. Who is queer um, as well, you said? He is queer as well. He identifies as a gay man. And I mean, I also have a, a nine-year-old, she'll be 10. And then we have a four-year-old who will be five in a few months. So amazing. they're growing up around here. <laughs> yeah. Um, so how, how's the journey been with your parenting in general um, mm -hmm. as, a, as a queer mom? You know, um, some of the, <laughs> how have you answered some of the questions like, you know, where's my dad? Um, so my kids won't ask where is their dad for the most part because they do have relationships with um, with their father, but for our youngest specifically, she's only ever been in a house with two moms, um, and she hasn't really gotten to the point where she asks um, that specific question. But I've seen the question come up a lot in community conversations within our um, private exhood group, and a lot of the time, what you say is, you know, there are people you have two, first of all from in the most part too, and you may be a, um, a solo parent by choice, which is also an amazing journey, but you have a parent that loves you. You explain if they have a donor, you explain that donor relationship. If they are adopted, then you just explain that relationship. I am very transparent with my kids. So I share, there's nothing people try to say like, you know, about like th certain things not being age appropriate, but kids understand a whole yeah. lot more than we often <laughs> give them credit for. Right. Um, so I, I talk to them and just communicate and let them ask the questions that they have following up. Most of the time, by the time I answer the question, they're like, okay, and then off to, off to do the next thing. Like they don't try to dive in. They take as, as your parent, as their parent, they trust you and what you're saying. So I would say, just share, um, let them know the, the full journey of how they got to be in this loving family that you're creating for them. Yeah. So honesty is the best policy. Honest, literally just be honest, just share. Um, because, and I think that question when it comes up, it's because they're surrounded with things that say family looks differently mm -hmm. um, than their own. So I think it's important. And another reason why we have exit, it's important for them to see families that look like theirs. Mm -hmm. um, and so we do a lot of community spaces where our families come together and those kids, our kids can see, you know, other, other two parent or same sex families, um, other families with that may have one or, or two trans parents. So we do all of that so that our kids can see, hey, like our families are loved. You are not the only one. So, cause they, a lot of time, you know, teenagers and even, even young kids, like it can be very selfish. They're like, this is only happening to me. Mm -hmm. I'm the only one with this weird ass family. Mm -hmm. No, you're not. <laughs> so putting them in, in a space where they can actually see that in action and build those relationships and gives them other people to talk to as well. Our teenagers um, in, in the group, they talk to one another. They, um, you know, let us know what's going on um, or they let each other know what's going on in their families and they've built friendships for it. And I can tell that it makes them stronger when they're trying to navigate the conversations that they have at school. Like um, my son initially, he his friends, they didn't have any problem asking us hey like so which one is which one of you are the mom and we're like no you see us both sitting here we are both <laughs> his mom, mom. like <laughs> teenagers are like that they try to try to be funny but like now like they love us they're like y'all are the best parents ever and they're like trying to be all over my instagram i'm like hey this is adults only zone over here <laughs> <laughs> so with your son uh like most you know i hear a lot of the stories um did you know that he was gay absolutely <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. There was, he is very um, outspoken. He talks to us about anything. Our dinner table gets 
real uh, because there's nothing that he won't share. And that's, he's always been like that. So it was kind of, we were never really waiting on a moment where he was like, I'm gay. I mean, he did, he did have that moment, but it wasn't even really for us. It was about navigating that conversation with our extended family, with his dad and their, and their extended family. Um, so I think that's why he just needed to like say it first to us. Mm -hmm. Um, even though he knew that we knew, um, just so we could kind of help him, um, guide the conversation with him coming out to more extended family. Yeah. Just kind of, uh, working that muscle yeah, <laughs> of, yeah. Of being definitely a lot of practice well he'll be in here like getting all upset with us and I'm like this uh, the, you're not upset with me but I like mommy hears you but yeah. I, I know that it's not about me um so it was definitely about just um building an area of support for him I feel like sometimes our house is this little love bubble and I we just want to really prepare him um for conversations that might be a little tougher than what he, he was like I'm gay and we were in the car and I was like okay like we don't we know son we love what you. you want for dinner yeah what do you want what do you want for dinner what's next now when he has conversations about like now he's a teenager he's 16 and we're about to be 16 sex and things like that like we be holding on to clinching the table like trying to not, not to freak out in front of him <laughs> um so those conversations are a little bit harder and sometimes he'll ask those questions we're like we don't know we're not gay men like we can't <laughs> tell you what to do next so like we yeah. try to him in community with our um, with our uh, queer gay friends or male gay friends um so that he can ask those questions um also exit has um a community manager that specializes in um conversations around gender sex and sexuality so she hosts information sessions that all of our parents can use when they're trying to help us navigate the topics for ourselves um and topics for our kids as well Nice, nice. That's that's hilarious. It sounds like he turned the tables on you a bit. You was went to your parents with all your girl problems, and he coming. He like, all right. So listen, this is what's going on today. I, I just be like, I appreciate. He's an oversharer too. I'm like, I appreciate yeah. sharing this with me. Like, I feel so loved and let in. And it, as a as a bonus parent um, of his, it's easy as a step parent or bonus parent to feel on the outside. He never makes me feel on the outside. Um, and so when we have those conversations, I just be trying, like I said, clenching my hands real tight. Like, don't react. As soon as he walks away, then you can react. Because then I'll be like, what? Why are we thinking about this right now? Like, focus on your books. Right. Um, so, but I try not to be that parent. I know that you're you're human and you're yeah. worried about companionship and love and sex and feeling good and all those things. Um, so I'm not naive enough to think that we won't have to have those conversations or that if I don't have them with you, that you won't go um, and have them with somewhere else so, with someone else. So I'm right. hoping that I'm giving him the information that he's looking for and that he's not putting himself in unsafe positions, sir. You and wanting apps and all the things i know you're gonna um listen to this as well so <laughs> keep it cute <laughs> yeah. but uh, on that I, I definitely um the, to round out that that conversation or that topic um for one um how do you it you, this may apply to you directly or i'm sure probably have heard about it but like um when there are other parents involved um, I've heard, you know, situations where it's not always a positive on the other side. There's like, you know, uh, the other parents will say stuff like, you know, marriage is between a man and a woman. And mm -hmm. then they're coming home and you, you kind of got to like unwind or, or like undo a little bit of that. What does that look like from both the, the perspective of talking to the child and then also talking to the other parent to make sure that those boundaries are kind of established rather whether they believe in it or, or, or uh, affirm it or not, but like, how do you kind of establish those boundaries to make sure that the child, you know, is protected? Yeah. So co-parenting can be difficult as someone that has a baby mom and a baby dad. Um, it can be, it can be difficult. Um, especially when they're trying to navigate, like in our case, separation of me and um, my ex fiance. So they're trying to figure out, the kids are trying to figure out boundaries of their own. We're trying to navigate this new style of relationship, um, relationship that we have as co-parents. And what I will say is control with you, what you can control. And a lot of the times that's in your own household. Um, so if you're navigating with someone that may be homophobic or transphobic or whatever the case is, you can't control what they do and say in their home. What you can do is when your kids get home, squeeze them a little tighter, let them know that you miss them and keep going with the parenting goals that you have set for yourself in your home. Um, that when you try to either 
show up at, you know, be mom and bonus mom or be mom and dad, um, because they, maybe they have an absent parent. You can't do that. You can only be you. Um, when you're help, when they're having conversations, well, like at, at another co-parent's house and it's like, well, they said a relationship, like you said, is a, is a man and a woman. And here I'm like, okay, but what do you see when you come into this house? How does it feel when you come into this house? What have you know learned from us? Do you feel love when you here? Do you feel happy when you're here? That's what's what matters. If that, if as long as you feel those things, they can say whatever they want to about our house and allow our kids are at ages where like they shut it down. <laughs> they're like, no, that's we, right. <laughs> like, you know, there there were points where where my older ones, their dad would say things like, uh, that's not your mom. Now they're like that my nine-year-old will say that is my mom <laughs> like yes I know that you you were married to my biological mom but you know mom Mia is my mom too and they will share that so I think as long as you keep reaffirming that of who you are to them um in your co-parenting relationship and what you know relationship you're looking to build with them with the, what you want them to feel in, feel in your home control that space trying to control everything else you're going to drive yourself insane you don't have that far of a reach. Your ego is going crazy. You're doing too much. You can't do nothing about what they're doing or saying over there. Eventually, what I will share is that they will make it uncomfortable for your kids and they won't want to be there. There are some times where my son doesn't even want to go to um, to his father's house because he's like, I just don't even want like all that in my ear. Like, I don't want to have to go to their church and hear those things and hear people putting us down because it makes him feel bad. You know, just it hurts him and he knows like what he feels here and he just will eventually get to, they, they get to a point where they can start advocating for themselves and removing themselves from the situation. So if they want to damage their relationship with your loving children because they can't keep down the homophobic rhetoric, then sorry for them because they're going to miss out on that relationship. Absolutely, absolutely. That's good. Control what you can control. Yes, control what you can control. And that is in is. your house, how you speak to your kids, what um, community that you put around them when they are with you. And those few days that they're gone, it's not going to change. If they're not going to come home hating you. I can promise that. Right, right. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, traveling. Let's do it. Where are we going? You like to travel. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love to travel I have a, a bucket list and I mean and it's, we're checking them off yeah so you travel as a family yeah we travel as a family so I try to have each style of vacation so I try to do like stuff with just me where I can get settled you know we got to have vacations going on and then we do our full family trips which for us is a lot because there's five of us <laughs> um, but yeah we do family vacations as well yeah. How do you navigate traveling uh, as a queer family? Um, you know, I know you you hear a lot about just like places that are not necessarily safe for queer people to, to travel. Um, you know, I know, you know, my my wife and I, we kind of uh, we travel a lot as well. And um, we we just kind of you just kind of play the environment a little bit like you just kind of see where you're at and how comfortable you can be mm -hmm. in your sexuality in public. Um, and then you just kind of go from there. Um, but how do you as a family navigate that when your kids are like, mom, mom, or, you know, <laughs> just the whole groups together? How do you, how do you navigate that? So we do a lot of research, honestly. I'm always on somebody's like travel blog, Googling something um, about like specific queer affirming places that we can travel. Um, but honestly, I will say even the places where I'm like, mm, we might run into a little bit of issue. These kids melt people's hearts. Like when people start seeing babies and little people, they just, they're not even looking at, it, it happens as a parent anyways. Once you have a baby, nobody sees you anymore. So most of the time we, it's we're, it's, we have less problems when we're with the kids than if it's just me and my partner, because all they see is these cute little faces and kids are running in a million directions. Nobody, as parents, normally when you're traveling somewhere else, you're going to another like family friendly resort or villa or location or something like that. So everybody's chasing their kids and not worried about um, what you have going on. Um, but our kid, we specifically do share with them them, like we give them a choice of where we're going, what we're what what we want to do, where we want to go. Um, and then we do a lot of, like I said, research and planning ahead. Um, and like, and now that our kids are a little bit old, older, they can, like I said, navigate those conversations around how their family is built. And we have not actually run into any issues in the places that we've been. Awesome. What's next on your list? Oh, I have a birthday trip to plan. Um, so I am thinking I've never been to Africa in all of my travels. So I 
navigating a trip to Africa has also been like, okay, where can I go that I don't want, I don't want to feel like I'm hiding um, or anything like that, but I do want to, you know, just be respectful and put myself in the safest position that I can um, with navigating travel. So I'm thinking about Zanzibar maybe, Mm. or the Seychelles or somewhere like that. So we'll see where I land, but that's definitely coming up next. That's awesome. All right. So let's talk about Black Parent Summit coming up. Let's Let's get into it. it. Yes. First Um, inaugural summit. The first inaugural Black Parent Pride Summit. It's June 25th and 26th in the Black Gay Mecca of Atlanta, Georgia. And I'm really excited. We're holding it at, well, it's two days. We're holding it at the Switchyards, their downtown location. They have a few. It'll be a full day. Well, the first day will be a full day of workshops, panels, conversations, small groups, things like that, where you can learn about um, building family and just build community. We're constantly in a position where we're like, we want more, more mom and parent friends, my mask friends. They're like, okay, where are the other mask moms at? How did you navigate this process? How did you, you know, make the decision whether you wanted to carry or not carry? How do we navigate that as, as mask people? So like we're having small groups for y'all. Like it's going to be amazing. Um, we're going to end the day with a party. Like I said, I'm from New Orleans. We're going to have to have at least one party. Um, and then the second day will be a brunch. And then we're going to have a special guest that I'm not, I was going to share, but I'm going to wait. Y'all will have to wait for the big announcements for the oh, special man. guest. We'll we, ain't no exclusive today, y'all. Today. <laughs> we ain't getting no exclusive, y'all. No exclusive. No oh, exclusive. man. We're hoping to nail, like literally, no, I would share, but we're hoping to nail it down. Like this week, get things. We don't want to jinx it. I, I understand. So. I got it. I understand. Nice. So um, what are, for the people who, um, you know, may or may not be able to travel to Atlanta mm-hmm. um, in person, are there any, are there going to be any uh, resources or any, any yeah. anything that they can get out of it as well? Absolutely. So even leading up and after the summit, you'll see a bunch of um, virtual conversations that we'll host either on our Instagram or directly within our group. Don't feel like you have to already be a parent. Um, It's for soon to be parents. It's for parents that are parenting without the title. We're Black people. We got aunties that have been stepping in for forever. We got godparents that would like do anything for us. So like all of you are invited as well. Um, But as far as virtual options, we will be, I think that we're going to stream at the very least, it will be recorded and released to the community. get given access to the community after the summit. I wanted to make sure that I'm providing um, the safest space for our virtual options. So because we'll have a lot of deep conversations and a lot of opportunities for Q&A, it's hard to navigate everybody's um, safety situation. So uh, we'll, I wanted to do live streaming, but it's looking like we will have to record the sessions, edit, get things released, and then have to um, release those sessions afterwards. Yeah, no, I totally understand that. Totally understand. That's awesome. So, you know, we definitely want to make sure if people can't get to Atlanta that they can still get access. Yes. Obviously, they should follow, subscribe to your group, follow the yes. follow all your 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 um pages if and everything. Follow um at parent X Hood, then you will see all of the summit information, all of the p- speakers, all the panels, and then you will also um, be notified there when the virtual options are available. Awesome, awesome. All right, well, we've come to the end, but I got two more questions for you. Okay. One is, if you had a theme song for your life, what would it be? Giving the best that I got. That is my theme song for it's where I'm one. at in life and continuing yeah. in life. It's easy Doing to be guilty and come down hard on yourself as a parent, as a founder, as an entrepreneur. So literally giving this the best that I got. <laughs> yeah, I feel you. I feel you. We're doing amazing. So so don't don't be too hard on yourself. Thank keep, you. keep going. Uh, and if you had advice for for specifically from you um for someone who's a parent to a queer child what advice would you have to them love them hold them tight I feel like sometimes we get really focused on preparing them um for the outside world and like wanting to like you know know what's what's going to be out there and how it's going to be hard and tough and rough and all those things no just love on that baby, create that safe, loving space in your home um, because the world is going to be there. It's going to get there. You don't have to, you know, do things harder in your house 
because you want them to be prepared, prepared for the outside. Just focus on loving that baby and keeping them close to your heart and getting them in touch with their community because we all know that we were never meant to do this alone. You were never meant to do it alone as a parent, even partnered couples. Y'all were never meant to just do it by yourselves. So get in touch with your community and hold that baby tight and get them in touch with their community as well. That's awesome. That's amazing advice. Tell the people where they can find you. I can be found at the Big Mama Mia on all of the places, Twitter, Instagram, all those things. And specifically for X Hood related things, just type in at Parent X Hood on all your major platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter as well. And yeah, we'll see you there. I hope y'all will come and join us. Like I said, it's not just for those who are already parents. If you're curious and you don't know where to get your questions answered, if you think at some point, you know, this may be for me um, and you've just been kind of scared to hold that space for yourself, please come and join us. We would love to have you. Yes, yes, yes. All right, y'all, we've come to the end. This is another episode of the Quirly Black Show. Thank you to our guest today, Mia, for sharing such amazing information. We got a very interesting perspective today um, on navigating parenthood um, and just some, some great information. Y'all check out the Black Parent Summit in June. More information on all of her socials. So make sure y'all go follow her. And as always, this is the Quirly Black Show. I'll catch y'all on the next one. <laughs>